Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Alexis Klein, and I'm the Director of Mission Delivery and Grant Management with the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America. I'm delighted to welcome everyone here tonight for Approaches to Managing MS in 2022, a research update featuring Dr. Andy Wu. Before I hand the night over to him though, I did wanna take just a few moments to highlight some of MSAA's programs and services. If you've connected with MSAA before, you've likely met them. MSAA's toll-free national helpline is staffed by individuals with a background in counseling or social work and are familiar with MS. Helpline specialists can share information about MSAA's programs and services, as well as the resources from the broader MS support community. For eligible individuals, MSAA also has equipment and cooling garment programs to provide tangible items that address some of the symptoms of MS, such as cooling vests for individuals experiencing heat sensitivity or four-pronged walkers for mobility support. MSAA also hosts an MRI access fund for individuals who are facing barriers to obtaining a cranial or C-spine MRI to confirm a diagnosis of MS or to track disease progression. Finally, MSAA also has a robust online community, which includes programs such as the My MSAA Forum and the MS Conversations blog, as well as the MSI website, where programs like tonight's will be available on demand for viewing when you're available. If you have questions about these or would like more information about any of MSAA's programs, please don't hesitate to send us an email, to give us a call, or visit us and give us a chat. And without further ado, I am delighted and honored to introduce our esteemed speaker for tonight, Dr. Andy Wu. Dr. Wu, Dr. Wu is in private practice at Santa Monica Neurological Consultants and serves as an assistant clinical professor of neurology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and Cedar sinai Medical Center. Listed as one of America's top physicians by the Consumer Research Council of America, Dr. Wu also serves on the Navigating MS International Steering Committee and is a member of the Board of Directors for the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America. Dr. Wu, welcome, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Great, thank you so much uh, for having me. Let me uh, share my screen here. Uh, tonight, I am very honored to uh, be with you all. So hopefully all over the country. I'm here in uh, Los Angeles, uh, although I know it looks like um, the Maldives in the back there, but it's actually Los Angeles. So tonight I'd like to uh, go over a number of things. I was asked to kind of give a, an overview of some research updates, uh, but in, in order to do that, I think we have to kind of look at MS, uh, do a little review about MS. I know many of you are very seasoned, but I also like to nerd out with you a little bit and cover a little bit of a brief immunology review. My PhD is in neuroimmunology. So I think just to get kind of a vocabulary to kind of understand what's on the horizon as far as research goes, I would like to go over a little bit of immunology. I'll review a little bit about current treatments. A lot of the, uh, the stuff here will be really more for your reference. So you guys can, I guess, you know, log on online and look at it later. So there will be some details here that are kind of beyond the scope of what we'll talk about, but I'll highlight a few things here and there about some of the current treatments some tricks about symptom management, since I do have you for this um, evening. Um, having done patient programs over the years, I've learned from you guys some tricks um, from your caregivers, from yourselves, that I always like to pass along with uh, to other patients. And then one of my interests is um, I'm Asian and Chinese New Year's coming up. You see some dumplings there on the left. So uh, dietary stuff is a very interesting thing to me. And a lot of times people will come in and maybe you yourself will ask your nurse practitioner or your doctor, hey, you know, what should I be eating? I'm taking my MS medication, but are there data for supplements or dietary stuff and, and what's really out there? So I, I like to kind of focus in on that as part of our research kind of thing on the horizon. Are there actually data supporting doing things as far as lifestyle changes for dietary stuff and the whole mystery about the gut microbiome, which transcends not just MS, but also other conditions with immune Kind of things like rheumatoid arthritis, also colitis, Crohn's disease, but also the gut microbiome now is a hot area of research also for things like Alzheimer's dementia, Parkinson's disease, and even psychiatric conditions uh, like depression and bipolar. So we'll dive into that and we'll also of course talk about some of the hot things on the horizon as far as some of the new medications that are kind of coming along the pipeline like the, the BTK inhibitors you may have heard of, also some of the hot things about biomarkers, um, 
And also last week, there's a lot of press about Epstein-Barr virus, which we've been talking about for decades. And I think we probably need to address that as well. All right, so MS background, uh, I won't go into too much detail here. I think many of you have experienced many of these things here as far as having a Lermit sign, that kind of electric feeling when you kind of tip your head forward and down, the UTAS phenomenon as far as the heat sensitivity. But you know, when you look at this list here, I think many of you have experienced really the single most common symptom of MS is really the fatigue, the inexplicable fatigue, no matter how much rest you get. And um, I'm just gonna kind of pass through some of these things here. As far as a typical demographics here, uh, as you know, more common in women than men. There are some genetics. People often ask us, especially during the first meeting, hey, how likely is it that I might pass this on to my child? And certainly there are genetics involved with MS. There are over 150 genetic factors that have been identified over the years involved with MS. But if you have MS, the likelihood that your child will have MS is only about 4%. So even with identical twins, you know, same DNA, same house, same marching band, same you know everything, same DNA, identical twins, only about 35% of the twin sister gets MS. For identical twin brothers, it's only about 6% of the twin brother gets MS. So definitely genes are part of the factor, but not the only factor. And the HLA-DR and HLA-DR2 and DQ are some of the genes that actually increase risk of getting MS. Uh, the DR2 is about increases about threefold increased risk of getting MS. Uh, other things you see here in the red, other risk factors for increasing risk of getting MS, childhood obesity, cigarette smoking, exposure to pesticides. I, one thing I didn't list there is not just um, head trauma, but multiple concussions between about the age of 11 and 19. Those are some of the more recent studies. Low vitamin D levels and also Epstein-Barr virus uh, that we'll go into more detail in a moment. What about stress? Now, this is a common question. People actually uh, kind of wonder, well, definitely I feel worse with my MS when I'm more stressed. Uh, does stress actually cause MS? So stress doesn't cause MS, but an interesting study you may have heard of a number of years ago, almost 10 years ago now, that um, stress actually can have an impact on uh, the MRI scan, uh, not so much the relapses. There's an interesting study where they just did talk therapy, less than an hour a week, about 50 minutes for six months versus a group of patients who didn't get that and they followed their MRI scans. So it's 120 patients and those that got talk therapy, no medication intervention or anything else. And they actually changed their MRI spots, which is amazing to me, they just stress management. We can't emphasize it enough how important mindfulness is to decrease your stress because it literally changed their, not just their gadolinium enhancing lesions, uh, but their T2 bright spots on their MRI scan just by stress management. So we always want to respect the whole mind-body continuum, exercise, diet, sleep, stress management, that type of thing. Very, very important for your, your lifestyle. As you know, there are different types of MS and oftentimes people kind of wonder, well, what type do I have? And in, in reality, you know, this is more important for our, the nerds uh, the, the, well, like us who run the trials and things to try to pigeonhole people into different trials groups and everything. But in reality, patients sometimes kind of bounce back and forth and don't necessarily fit perfectly into an exact type. The most common type, relaxed and remitting, a certain percentage over time, uh, especially if untreated with medication, uh, will transition over years, sometimes to secondary progressive. And then a smaller percentage of people have what's called primary progressive um, over years, may have a, a, a different type of progression and um, but that is a smaller percentage of patients over the years. I won't spend too much time on diagnosis, but I will say that for those of you who've had spinal taps, uh, I had a spinal tap, I needed spinal fluid for my research during my PhD. So one trick that I like to do to decrease the risk of getting a spinal headache for those of you who had a spinal headache after your spinal tap, always ask for a pediatric 22 gauge needle, which is a smaller needle. It does take a little bit longer, but it really reduces the risk of getting a headache afterwards. Um, obviously, if you've already had it done, you probably don't need another spinal tap, uh, but that's just a little trick we'd like to do to decrease the risk of getting that uh, spinal type headache. The evoked potential testing, we don't do as much as we used to because the MRIs now are such more, much more sensitive than they were years ago. And then just one little note, I'll highlight some of the new testing methods you may hear about T2 star, 
and flare star, those are some new techniques uh, that are very, very sensitive for looking at some of the things we'll talk about later, uh, such as the central vein sign, some other um, things that are kind of new in the MRI world, trying to diagnose earlier. And there's some pathology um, things that are, are being very, uh, that are very interesting that might actually lead to some treatments that we'll talk about in a moment as well. Uh, prognosis, there, there are different types of MS, as you probably know, as, as far as when people first get their symptoms, some patients get a very first symptom, we call it clinically isolated syndrome, but there are patients we, we actually find who don't have symptoms, but have spots on their MRI scan. And oftentimes these are situations where we find it kind of by accident. So this is kind of around 2008 or so, Darren Nakuda was one of the first really to describe this, where patients um, had MRI spots or lesions or plaques, and, uh, and we kind of follow these patients very carefully because they have a high likelihood um, possibly of turning into MS. So that's called RIS, radiologically isolated syndrome. I'll move along here. So let me spend a little time talking about the immunology of MS. So, you know, when we talk about, yes, MS is one of these immune mediated conditions. You think about your immune system as, oh, it's your white blood cells, your B cells, which go on to produce antibodies when you get a vaccine, and your T cells, which help regulate the immune system. And then you have other white blood cells, like your macrophages, which are like your Pac-Men and Pac-Women that kind of chop on bacteria and viruses and funguses and all the evil forces out there, like, you know, Boston Celtics and Dallas Cowboys and all the evil things here. I am, of course, a, a sad Steelers fan, kind of crying, crying myself to sleep now. Uh, but so the immune system protects you from all those bad evil forces out there. But with an MS, as you know, the immune system is actually too active. So what happens, it actually is so active, it actually starts attacking the covering of the nerve called myelin. So if you look at you know, the telephone cord, yes, the rubber coating is called myelin. And when it gets chewed up and inflamed by parts of the immune system, whether it's the cells or the antibodies or the complement proteins, that reaction shows up in irritation. Uh, the, the inflammation is called demyelination. And that actually shows up as the bright spots that you see on an MRI scan. So yes, if you look under a microscope and you look at that bright spot on the MRI scan, what is that biologically? Yes, that's demyelination. Now, the good news is that over time, that may heal with or without treatment with steroids, pill steroids, IV steroids, or just with time if you're lucky. However, underneath the wiring called the axons, sometimes uh, that does not repair itself. And that's called axonal loss. And that shows up as kind of the dark spots. So when you think about the immunology of MS, there are a lot of players there. There are a lot of... Um, uh, people involved. So what are some of these factors that I'm talking about? So if you look here at the kind of the bottom, let's see if I have a point here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do. All right, here we go. So the cells of the immune system have to get into the brain and spinal cord to cause that inflammation. Just very briefly, for example, the B cells here, which go on to become plasma cells and squirt out antibodies. They have to cross what's called the blood-brain barrier. It's like getting through security, TSA at the airport. They have to have the right ID markers, adhesion molecules, and that type of thing in order to get across. And then once inside the brain or spinal cord, then they set up shop, cause inflammation. They sometimes what's called present antigen. So they actually react sometimes with T cells and other cells. And then they re release all these chemicals and they cause more inflammation. These chemicals are called cytokines. You may hear of them called interleukins and these types of things. And then there are all these other cells I mentioned like the macrophages, and those are the ones that are kind of chomp things. And the macrophages in the brain and spinal cord, they are called microglial cells. And the reason why I mentioned them is they are important for not only kind of scavenging cells and, um, and regulating some of the immune things, but they are also very important for repairing things. And so when you guys say, well, hey, you know what? Is there anything that's going to repair my nerves? Can I fix stuff? Can I repair the myelin or remyelinate? Well, the microglial cells actually have a role in repair, not just clean up and, and you know, cleaning up the, the garage and sweeping up stuff, but also repairing things. And we'll talk about some things that may um, have a role and medications may actually have a little bit of data towards repairing the remyelination. On the other half of the story is, well, what about these fried egg cells here, the ligodendrocytes? Those are the cells that actually make myelin and uh, put the myelin rubber coating back on the cells. So there's this kind of constant thing going on with inflammation, and inflammation kind of uh, kind of rubbing off the rubber there, but also the ligodendrocyte is frantically trying to make myelin, but also this 
illegal debt collector is sometimes being told to stop working, it gets pink slipped, it gets government furloughed, to stop working, that's called apoptosis, where it's told to kind of sit, sit tight and not work anymore. And, uh, and so there's this constant uh, battle of signals uh, of information, cell death, and, and, it, and that type of thing. So lots of things going on. The other thing I want to mention is there's this kind of balance of immune cells in the MS, kind of this information and anti-information, this kind of yin-yang, wax on, wax off kind of thing. So if you look on the right side, we like this in MS because this kind of quiets the immune system. And the reason why I mention this is a lot of the research and a lot of the, even the dietary stuff we talk about, we're going to be mentioning things like these things called T-regulatory cells. The T-reg cells, we actually like them because they kind of quiet the immune system and they secrete chemicals cytokines that kind of quiet the immune system. On the other half, on the left there, these are cells that increase inflammation, uh, like interleukin-17, uh, Th1, these effector cells, they actually increase inflammation, so we don't like them because they, they worsen MS. The Th17 cell is actually uh, not, that, not that old. Um, it was only discovered in mice in 2005 and in humans in 2007 when your iPhone came out. So it's actually not that old as cell, it's a pretty new concept. So there's that delicate balance between inflammation and quieting inflammation. And when we talk about some of the dietary stuff, um, there is actually a balance that you can affect even through dietary means. So just a quick review on some of the things that are out there currently that we're using and you guys are using for your MS. For acute attacks, as you know, steroids are what we use, either the IV steroids, you, Many of you have experienced or pill steroids. And then for other kind of symptoms, again, these are th things that are used for the symptoms, for fatigue. The only things I'll kind of highlight without going through the entire list is for those of you who do get benefit from things like ProVigil, Modafinil, or New Vigil, or Modafinil, you'll realize that now over the past several years, insurances are, will, will not cover it unless you have documented sleep apnea or you work night shifts as a nurse, security guard, truck driver. Otherwise, it's crazy, crazy expensive. So yes, 30 pills might cost $400 or $600 at Rite Aid or CVS or Walgreens. However, um, go to GoodRx, because GoodRx, with a doctor's prescription, here in Los Angeles, it costs maybe $22, $23 for 30 pills, uh, generic modafinil. So uh, ask your doctor for GoodRx if something like the ProVigil or NuVigil generic is effective for you. Uh, and that's true for any medication, whether it's heart medicine, cholesterol medication, if you have no insurance or insurance no longer covers things like uh, our Parkinson's patients, Rosagiline, uh, Lyrica, Pregabalin, if you're using that, for example, for spasms or um, numbness or tingling or back pain, um, those, the, those medications uh, on GoodRx are much, much less expensive. Another thing I'll just highlight here is for numbness, um, there are medications that are still being taught in medical school and in neurology programs, the tricyclic antidepressants, the Elevil, which is amitriptyline, Pamelor, which is nortriptyline. These medications have a lot of pretty good data for what we call neuropathic pain. So in, they've been used historically in MS for numbness, for tingling, for nerve pain, for migraine headache prevention, and for neuropathy and diabetes. I was never a big fan of them because number one, patients often get a little bit tired on them. Number two, you often get a little bit of a dry mouth. Number three, uh, patients often get a little bit of weight on them. So I think there are another number of other options. I was never a big fan ever since you know, residency and in practice for this many years. And then in 2015, there have actually been a number of data sets, uh, drama, inter drama internal medicine, January 2015, drama internal medicine, 2019, August, and then British Journal, and then even neurology in 2016, uh, showing that these tricyclic antidepressants actually increase risk of dementia uh, if you take them chronically for many years. And uh, as well, and because they dry out the acetylcholine chemical, just like Benadryl. So Benadryl, totally safe. We use it for rashes, et cetera. But if you start using Benadryl every night, either for sleep or you're taking um, things like uh, Tylenol PM or Motrin PM or those types of medications or Benadryl every night for insomnia over a three-year period, it actually does increase risk of Alzheimer's dementia by about 54%. And that was published back in 2015. So I'm never a big fan of these um, anticholinergic type medications like the tricyclic antidepressants or taking Benadryl too long over a three-year period because that data has been out there and repeated about at least four different data sets. Um, so I'll just kind of comment on those two things. What about 
the medications out there. Well, as far as treatment for MS, very different than when I was a resident years ago at UCLA and a fellow, uh, there are a lot of options out there. Not just injections from 1993, but pills coming out in 2010, IV medications uh, once a year, twice a year, et cetera. And now it's a big buffet, especially with you know, Chinese New Year's coming up, uh, a lot of options. So a lot of um, different medications, not just for relapsing and remitting MS, but also for primary progressive MS and secondary progressive MS. So really for, for MS patients, there, there's really, what we're trying to find really the best medication for each individual MS patient now. So it's a very exciting time. So to me, I'm Asian, everything's a buffet, everything's a food analogy. So um, a lot of options out there. So what are they like? Well, big question, they all taste like chicken? Well, that's for you to decide with your physician, but there are options. There are self-injections, there are intravenous medications, and there are pill options. So if you actually look at all the different formulations, and then of course, some of them have different brands and depending on insurance with covered, there are actually 22 different medications out there. And again, some of them are the same brand, but kind of different formulations, uh, but there are a lot of options there. And so my point is that really, if you're not on an, a disease modifying therapy, we call them DMTs, it's something that you, you really should consider with your physician and your nurse practitioner. What about the pills? You know, before 2010, everyone's saying, oh, you know, it'd be great if there are pills out there. There are pills out there now. And, and these have different mechanisms of action. Some of them are what we call these S1P receptors. They're kind of homing receptors that kind of traffic help the white blood cells, the lymphocytes, traffic through the bloodstream. But if you jam your GPS receptor, then they're not so interested in going up to the brain and spinal cord to cause inflammation. So they kind of hang out sequestered and hiding in your lymph nodes. And so that's how these Jelenia and Mazent and uh, Zaposia and Ponveri kind of work. Uh, Abagio is a different mechanism, Tecfidera is a different mechanism. Part of the reason why I wanna mention that is that when we talk later about some of the trials looking at trying to decide between high efficacy and lower efficacy medications, that's kind of been a big debate over the years about when you have MS, should you start with some of the stronger or higher efficacy medications or should you save them for when patients are having more difficulty? Um, the Jelenia and Mazent are the only two pills, I'm sorry, the Enzoposia and Panvori, the S1P class are the only pills considering the high FSC class, along with some of the other intravenous medications like Lemtrada and Ocrevus and uh, the injection case symptom, the B-cell therapies, and, um, and also cladribine. Um, uh, Maven clad. So those are considered the high efficacy medications uh, compared to the other 22 medications. And we make that distinction. So we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. So why consider treatment if you're not on treatment? I won't go into great detail here, but there are many data sets over the years showing that uh, MS does tend to progress over time. And there are many benefits to being on a disease modifying therapy. And so these are some of those there's reasons listed. So I, I won't go into great detail, but there are advantages to being on therapy, even if you feel fine, even if you haven't had um, a, a problem for a while. I mean, there's a, something called the EPIC study that UCSF has been doing for over 10 years, showing that even patients on treatment who feel fine, um, they, they actually are having um, some, some brain atrophy and, and shrinkage and things. So there are things that are actually happening kind of in a silent fashion. Um, so there, there is progression. Um, even when patients are even not on treatment as well. So um, there are a lot of things being researched these days. So um, actually for symptoms, just want to touch upon a couple things here. For symptom management, and these are not disease-modifying therapies, uh, Ampira was FDA approved in 2010 for walking speed. Nudexta is for some of the behavioral things for pseudobulbar palsy when patients are a little bit more reactive emotionally. I want to point out the LDN, low-dose naltrexone, is not FDA approved. That's actually just something prescribed by a, by a physician, has to be made by a company pharmacy. But there is a little bit of data from uh, Bruce Crete, UCSF, a small study showing that it did have some benefit uh, for, for a sense of well being, for pain, and self reported uh, cognition. There are some specific patient types for uh, MS in children. Jelena is FDA approved. There are some medications listed here for secondary progressive MS. And there's one medication uh, for primary progressive MS that's approved, and, and that's Ocarus, which came out in March 2018, the IV medication twice a year. Well, we also learned from looking behind us. So 
you know, despite all these 22 medications we have in our buffet available, there are a lot of things that were looked at that unfortunately uh, didn't work. And so here are some examples that were very exciting at the time, different pills, looking at myelin, you think, okay, well, if the covering of the nerve is a problem, what if you took the covering of the nerve, got your immune system to kind of react to it and maybe try to you know, develop some type of uh, immunity to that, that was back in 93, um, that didn't work. Estrogen, as many of you know, during pregnancy, and that seems to get a little bit better. And after pregnancy, some patients may have a little bit of a flare up during that first couple of weeks or months, but that seems to be tempered if the, if the mother, if the woman is actually breastfeeding and um, Dr. Nanda Langergold has shown some of that data very nicely. Um, but so estrogens have been looked at. The estrogen study, the oral estriol study, E3, uh, actually was not, um, was not able to show benefit, however. So a lot of these things listed here have been looked at uh, and some of the T cell receptor vaccines over the years have not been uh, efficacious as well. So lots of things have been looked good in animal models, looked good preliminary in, in patients, but didn't seem to pan out. So let's move on to some dietary things uh, that I always find very interesting. And again, this is this is the thing that's, that's good because this is something you could do to empower yourselves. This is a lifestyle thing. And there are actually some data sets that actually have positive data. So I've got the, the three M's of MS, the manja, microbiome, and molecule. So what am I talking about? So what about vitamin D? A lot of talk about vitamin D. Well, vitamin D actually does have some role in immunology. So there are a lot of genes with a vitamin D, uh, kind of actually adjacent to a number of the MS genes. There are actually vitamin D receptors on many of the, the cells of the immune system, on T cells, on the B cells, on the macrophages that we just saw on that little cartoon earlier. And vitamin D does seem to decrease some of those inflammatory chemicals released that are squirted out, the cytokines, and seem to increase, uh, decrease um, inflammation. Um, serum levels, just from an observ observational standpoint, uh, way back um, years ago, have been shown to have some, uh, observationally, some correlation to as far as developing MS risk-wise, as well as uh, relapses, atrophy, et cetera. So there are some data suggestive from an observational standpoint. Uh, now, the flip side is that um, it doesn't seem to be as true in African-Americans and Latinos. And then when the Cochrane Review looked at all the different trials, actually prospectively saying, all right, well, if you have MS, what if you were given vitamin D, does it really actually help your MS? And those studies have not really panned out. So again, observationally, there seems to be correlation as far as who gets MS and that type of thing. But when you're actually studying it and giving people MS, I'm uh, sorry, giving people vitamin D, um, it doesn't seem to be paying out. However, we, we typically do check vitamin D levels uh, at this point, um, just uh, as, as long as it's safe for that particular patient. What about salt? Well, not only in animal studies, but in patients as well. So the average American average is about, um, you know, three uh, grams of salt, uh, of sodium per day. In, um, in Japan, it's about, um, I think, about uh, five uh, grams salt today. I think Argentina is the highest, about seven grams of sodium per day. But uh, patients who have a low sodium diet, the MS, uh, tend to do better than patients who have a higher sodium kind of. So patients with MS who average about 4.6 grams of sodium per day versus low sodium, 2.3 grams, they have almost about 3.95 times more relapses than the low sodium MS patients. So, you know, if you enjoy sushi, you know, sushi, just reach for the green cap, sodium soy sauce. If you're at the te Texas State Fair, you know, maybe hold off on the fried butter. You know, these are just ideas, no judging. But, um, but salt does seem to make a difference. And, and at least in the animal model, they actually know some of the mechanisms. The sodium does seem to kind of jack up the serum glucocorticoid, um, corticoid kinase, SGK, um, which is an enzyme that kind of hyper educates and kind of gets the TH17 cell kind of excited. So there is some kind of inflammatory pathway there that sodium uh, does kind of incite a bit. What about other things? Uh, fish, caffeine, and alcohol. Um, there's an interesting study from Brussels back in 2011 um, and followed about 1,372 patients and found that over almost 20, 22 years that patients who ate fish or drank caffeine and then independent of that, uh, drank alcohol, they actually had a decreased progression of their MS as determined by uh, kind of uh, the disability scores uh, that we use in, in trials. And so, so um, Amanda Montague and then 
Alexis and, and Kyle Keegan and I have de developed a, a sardine brandy latte we'd like you to try. It's disgusting, but you're going to drink it because it's going to be good for you. And we're going to market it and we're all going to retire early. So there is something about the, the fish, whether it's the omega-3 fatty acids, um, caffeine, as you probably know, has been studied for other things. And there's some data for it as far as cognition goes. And then alcohol. And again, this is as far as um, this is that one study, but there have been other data sets also suggestive about fish oils or actual fish. And uh, Dr. Lang will show that as, as well. So um, there is something about that, the fish, the caffeine, the alcohol. Now, there was a study that people often ask, okay, well, if it's alcohol, then you know, what kind of alcohol? So there was a study that Brigham from the Harvard group um, showing that it was 80 proof and higher had an effect, but below 80 proof uh, did not seem to have an effect. And that's as far as developing MS. So again, I'm not telling you to, to drink alcohol. I'm not telling you what kind of drink uh, to alcohol. I'm just just presenting the data, not, not telling you what to do. All right, so what about specific diets? So you may have heard of uh, one of the older diets. Uh, Dr. Swank uh, had trained at Harvard, and when he was a fellow, he took on this project to, to look at uh, different uh, dietary things. And we're gonna dive into that a little bit. And people have talked about, well, what about glutens? And what about the Mediterranean diet? There are a lot of data use, looking at the Mediterranean diet for heart disease and stroke prevention. Alzheimer's dementia, that's already established that yes, it does actually decrease risk of strokes, heart attacks, and Alzheimer's dementia. Mediterranean diet you might be familiar with is heavy on the fish, vegetables, olive oil, and nuts, and trying to avoid processed foods, trying to cut back on, on, uh, on the processed foods and concentrated sweets, and cutting back on red meat. Not necessarily excluding all red meat, but kind of high, you know, favoring fish instead. So that type of thing. In the Walls diet, you might be familiar with uh, Dr. Terry Walls is a uh, physician in Iowa who got diagnosed around the year 2000 with MS and, um, and was treated with medications for MS and uh, was not doing as well as she wanted to. And she kind of took it upon herself to change her diet. And she developed, kind of modified the paleo diet and she modified it and she called it the Walls diet. So it's kind of a variation of the paleo diet with some calorie restriction and also a couple of added things as far as organ meats and bone broth, a lot of cruciferous vegetables, avoiding legumes, nuts, dairy, et cetera. Uh, I listed there the vegan diet, and then we'll talk a little bit about the intermittent fasting diets as well. So a number of different diets. Let's just spend a moment just talking about the Swank diet. So uh, Dr. Roy Swank, uh, again, trained on the uh, at Harvard and then was um, found that yes, patients in Norway with had a lot less MS if they lived on the coast where they had a lot more fish than on the inland part of Norway. So from that, and then when he kind of kept on uh, thinking about that diet, when he eventually kind of started the whole neurology department in, in Oregon, in Portland, and uh, he developed this kind of swipe diet that was really kind of heavy on the polyunsaturated fatty acids and more fish, kind of not uh, as much red meat and that type of thing, which of course is a very healthy diet. It's heart healthy. It's very good if you have diabetes or heart disease and high blood pressure, that type of thing. So he published a number of things over the years uh, with his Swank diet. Uh, and kind of going with that theme, these polyunsaturated fatty acid diets, some of the data uh, was negative, And then some of the data here at the bottom of the page was positive. But interestingly, it actually was more positive for the omega-6 fatty acids and not the omega-3 fatty acids. And then so when you look at some of these other uh, diets, you think, well, it's a lot of different diets to choose from. It's kind of confusing. There's a lot out there, the Swank diet, gluten diets, you know, the DASH diet. Uh, again, DASH is the um, dietary, um, uh, dietary, what is it? Dietary um, approaches to stop hypertension, which is again, kind of similar to uh, the, med uh, the Mediterranean diet as far as very heart healthy. And also the Wallace diet we mentioned, the vegan diet, and intermittent fasting diet, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, sometimes it's hard to choose. Sometimes it's hard to pick one. Hard to pick one, sorry, I apologize. So what are the actual data? Well, with the uh, Swank diet, I mentioned there is a little bit of positive data, but it's primarily with the omega-6 fatty acids, not omega-3 for some reason. Uh, the gluten diet, gluten elimination diets have really not panned out. Uh, there's a little bit of data for Mediterranean diet for fatigue, and disability scores, and also the MIND diet, which is kind of in, in that same realm of the DASH diet as being kind of heart healthy, more fish, vegetables, olive oil, cutting out or at least reducing red meat 
and that type of thing. And that's been published pretty recently. The Walls diet um, actually does not have any positive data. There's some open label studies, some small studies, uh, but has not shown any kind of positive uh, data for MS uh, so far. A uh, vegan diet has not shown any positive data to date. However, their intermittent fasting diet uh, does have four studies that are positive, two small animal studies and two patient studies. So, so if you're not familiar with intermittent fasting, um, you know, Jimmy Kimmel lost about 25 pounds on it. A lot of actors uh, do it, um, you know, Terry Crews, Ben Affleck, um, uh, a number of other people. So some people use it for weight loss. If you're kind of borderline diabetic, it will actually help reduce your sugars. Uh, but more importantly for our purposes, it has a profound effect on inflammation. And so the two popular ways to do it are the 5-2 or the 16-8. 5-2 refers to days of the week. So if you do 5-2, basically two days a week, you kind of restrict your calories, 500 calories, uh, two days a week, like a Tuesday, Friday, or Wednesday, Saturday for women, but for men, 700 calories on just those two days. But the other five days a week, you eat healthy. Uh, but what I think is actually more practical and easier is what's called 16-8, where during the day, you kind of skip breakfast, maybe you have your tea or coffee, but then you don't eat until around noon. And from noon until eight o'clock at night, you don't eat. So eight hours, you eat all your meals. Sorry, uh, noon to eight, you eat your meals. And then eight o'clock at night until noon the next day, those 16 hours, you're not eating. So that's why you're fasting 16 hours and eight hours you are eating. So that's why they call it 16-8. So in either case, you're kind of fasting, maybe you might be a little bit hungry, but your body gets used to it. What does that actually do? Um, a lot of immunologic things, and we'll take a look at that. So just to present some of the data, um, interestingly, in the animal model for MS, that um, is actually the standard model for which all of the 22 medications got FDA approved, it had a profound effect. And so what they found is that the animals actually did not get BMS. It's called EAE, experimental allergic encephalitis. They can do it in mice and rabbits and guinea pigs and, and uh, all sorts of different animals. The mice didn't get sick. So not only did they not get the MS, if you look here on the right side, the cells actually at day three and day 11, they didn't get the inflammation. So the CD4 cells and all those kind of inflammation cells that we saw in that cartoon were not there or much less so. And then when they looked at the myelin, here on that bottom kind of panel here, the myelin was actually preserved. So again, this was not a medication. This was not anything fancy. The mice were not injected. They were simply, the mice were actually fed every other day. Uh, so not only were they intermittently fed, oh, the mice, they were so skinny, they were so svelte, they were like, they were hanging out the pool, like sipping wine, having their little cheese, talking to their other mice friends, they look great. So again, it was simply simple, it was just intermittent fasting of the mice, no medication, nothing, uh, nothing fancy. So in the same thing, there's a small patient study done as well uh, that kind of correlate this. And this is done by uh, Avada Longer's group, actually Longo's group over at USC. And this was published in 2016. So there have been, um, there's another small patient group that was done kind of jointly between WashU and, and Yukon, Connecticut uh, also. So there actually been four studies now, two small patient groups and two small animal uh, studies as well, uh, showing that there is some benefit to the intermittent fasting, which is quite simple. Again, nothing fancy, uh, no injections, no medications. It's not even what you eat, it's the timing. So what is it about this that works? Let's dive in. Well, what happens is you actually change your gut bacteria. It changes the diversity of your bacteria. Now keep in mind, you have more bacteria in your gut than you have cells in your body. I mean, they're really, they tell you what to do. Uh, they And what happens is you actually increase your bacteria, uh, sorry, you, you increase your T regulatory cells and it decreases your TH17 cells. And remember, th those are the ones we like. We like the T regs and you quiet down the inflammatory TH17 cells. And other things that happen are you decrease leptin, which is inflammation. You talk to any obesity expert, yes, obesity is a kind of low smoldering kind of inflammatory condition and you increase adiponectin. And like I said before, Obesity is actually a risk factor for developing MS. So there's a whole area of research looking at ceramides, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, ceramides seem to be higher in obese MS patients. So what happens? Well, it turns out that MS patients have different bacteria than people who don't have MS. For example, on the left here, Methanobrevibacter smithii, which is one of the highest kind of um, um, gas-producing, methane-producing bacteria in the gut, it's about seven times higher than somebody who has MS compared to somebody who doesn't. 
So the, the top two are kind of the, the, the most common ones that are jacked up in MS, methenobrib, Rebecca smithii, and acromantia. So those two in particular, and then some of the other ones, the butyrosomonas and firmicutes and, and B-frag are, are much lower in MS pain compared to other pain. So you think, okay, well, that's great, but I still can't really connect the dots. Uh, what is it about these bacteria and, and how can I change that? If I have MS, what can I do? Well, it's really about having the right bacteria. The bacteria, when they break down your foods, they break down your foods into what are called short chain fatty acids. And there are three main ones. One is propionic acid or propionate. One is butyrate or butyric acid. And one is called acetate or acetic acid, which you might know is the fancy term for vinegar, right? So what is it about these, short, these three short chain fatty acids? And there are others as well. Well, these short chain fatty acids, they actually acetylate histones for all you biochemical nerds. And histones are very important in the promoter region of the Treg cells. And it gets the Treg cells to actually um, get kind of advanced and, and mature. So it actually helps the T regulatory cells um, get uh, excited and then they rise to prominence. And then of course they actually take over and helps them quiet down the TH17 cells. So if you have the right bacteria or more of the right bacteria, they will actually produce more short chain fatty acids and the short chain fatty acids help the T reg cells and they kind of shut down the TH17 cells, which ultimately decreases inflammation. So it's all about getting the right bacteria in your gut. Well, how do you do that? Well, one thing you can do is eat more foods that break down and are sources of short chain fatty acids like these listed here. Some of these starches like oats and barley, pectins like the greeny vegetables and fruits, apples, apricots, and then supplements. And I'm gonna, in the interest of time, it's gonna blow through a couple of things. There are two supplements. They're short chain fatty acids. They've been studied for MS. One was with uh, Dennis Bordet's group in Portland where this over-the-counter supplement, ALA, alpha lipoic acid, shut down brain atrophy about 67% over two years in, in secondary progressive patients. He had about 54 patients he followed. Likewise, a, a, a German group, a Ralph Gold's group in Germany, looking at propionate, he had about 300 patients and actually looked at them six years prior to starting the propionate and then followed them for about three years after starting. And they did, not everybody got MRI scans, but a subset of the 300 patients. Some got MRI scans, they looked at disability, they looked at relapse rates and they found uh, benefit uh, for relapse rates, disability, um, thalamic, uh, and um, kind of deep um, brain atrophy uh, benefit to just over-the-counter propionic, which is propionic acid. Uh, and also looking at the, uh, the immune things like uh, T regulatory cells and interleukin 10 as well. So again, these are short chain fatty acids that actually had some benefit. They're just supplements. For, uh, five things I'll just kind of briefly mention as far as supplements go. Lactobacillus, you may have heard of because that's one of the two Kind of bacteria and probiotics. Probiotics always have lactobacillus and phytobacterium. Well, we'll talk about bile acids. We'll talk a little bit about parasites. Ceramides tend to be jacked up and higher in obese patients and then fecal transplants. So lactobacillus, I won't go into great detail, but there are data both in the uh, animal model and also for probiotics. There have been some small uh, probiotic studies with MS as well that show some interesting immunologic um, kind of um, data, uh, not so much clinical yet, but at least immunologic data. With bile acids, so bile acids seem to be low both in adults and children with MS. And uh, the bile acids actually are kind of uh, related to kind of cholesterol metabolism. Uh, bile acids are very high in bear bile. So if your your Chinese herbalist says, hey, you got to wrestle bears for their bear bile, you don't have to because you can actually buy something called tudka, which is taro urso deoxycholic acid, tudka. And there's actually a Peter Galaparisi, uh, one of my med school classmates at, at Hopkins, his group is doing a study with Tudka because the animal studies show that Tudka shuts down MS in the animal model for, for MS. So um, they're actually doing a study in patients there. So that's another way of looking at, uh, again, the inflammation from a different a receptor, it's the TGR5 receptor on the microglial cell. Again, that's the scavenger chomp chomp cell in the brain and spinal cord. Uh, which may or may not have some effect on remyelination as well. What about parasites? Well, Coriali back in 2007 showed that, hey, his MS patients with parasites did better, sometimes even 19 times less relapses than his MS patients who didn't have parasites, you know, hookworm, tapeworm, whipworm. So there have been some, some patient studies, small patient studies, about 16 patients um, were studied uh, by another group looking at MS and parasites. And yes, they actually had about a 35% decrease 
uh, MRI spots, gadolinium enhancing MRI spots, uh, and also an increase in the TH, um, T regulatory cells as well. So there are some immunology, immunologically interesting things going on there. Ceramides, I mentioned, these are things that are involved with insulin resistance, fatty liver. They are elevated in obese patients, but they also seem to correlate with inflammation. So that's a, a biomarker that's being looked at. And then uh, basically uh, fecal transplants are being studied now. There's a lot of interesting data for fecal transplants that works very well for when people get C. diff colitis. You may have heard of when patients are on antibiotics for too long, sometimes they get a diarrhea because it wipes out your other bacteria and then the wimpy C. diff kind of rises to power and you get a terrible, very painful, hard to treat colitis. So transferring uh, uh, bacteria from somebody else um, so mikasa is sulcasa. Uh, that could actually uh, seem to help Can you replenish the, the good bacteria and it kind of takes, um, takes place of that. So that is actually being studied in MS in a number of centers around the country, either by catheter, by colonoscopy placement, or by capsules. So that's being studied now. We don't have any data yet. And then um, I think I'll skip over this, but MIIT cells are a very kind of hot area of, of research as well as some kind of interesting um, subsets of T cells that are very interesting in the gut. So what treatments have a leg up? Uh, um, my, my sons would be horrified that I'm still using this years later. They're much older now, so I, I move on. So when you think about, well, what drugs are, are best for MS? You know, we get this question all the time. Well, what, is, what should I get? What drug should I take? What is the best drug for MS? Well, neurologists are nerds, you see. And so they, they do head-to-head -head studies. Here are some examples. There are many more I didn't list, but there are a lot of head-to-head -head studies over the years looking at, well, this versus that, that versus this. And then, um, so those are some examples of studies looking at, you know, pitting one drug against the other. But again, everybody with MS is different. They're individuals. People like pills. What are some of the pills kind of being looked at on the horizon? Mastib is a, a French pill and is being looked at progressive types of MS. So mast, mastinib, if you're French, uh, works on mast cells and mast cells may have a role in MS. We don't usually talk about mast cells because they are usually involved more with allergies and an antibody called IgE, uh, but they do have some role in MS. Tadka, we talked about the BTK, BTK inhibitors. Uh, I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Clemistine was a study done at UCSF a number of years ago, which is antihistamine uh, over the counter, but it had some interesting, possibly even remyelinating type of, of properties theoretically. Uh, so that's being uh, looked at a little bit. Ibutalas is interesting also because that's a Japanese medication that's anti-inflammatory that has some atrophy data that's kind of interesting. So that's being looked at. Uh, we talked about propionate and then boswellic acid. That's, um, that's actually kind of a frankincense type thing. So that's a lipooxygenase uh, 5 that's been used in Europe for arthritis, aches and pains. But out of Heidelberg in Germany, that actually has some interesting MS data as well, at least from a radiographic MRI standpoint. So uh, these are some of the things I just mentioned. Um, studies specifically for secondary progressive MS, the clemistine hemipoietic stem cell transplant, and that's traditionally what we call bone marrow transplant, which does involve usually immunoablation with the chemotherapy, usually a cyclophosphamide, optical uh, cytoxan, and then also mesenchymal uh, cell transplant. So these are usually smaller studies uh, at Ectrams. There's a presentation of about 18 patients from the Cleveland Clinic, and so that was about 28 weeks and it passed through um, that and, and it seems to be safe. And about, um, about uh, 67 or 68% of patients did have some improvement on one of the cognitive parameters they're looking at, a processing speed test called the sing symbol digit um, modality test, the SDMT, and about 38% also had some improvement on a MS kind of walking scale as well. So again, it's preliminary. It's only been about 28 weeks for those roughly about 18 patients, but it seemed to be safe and they seem to tolerate. And again, that type of stem cell, which you could do really from just adipose, you know, fat tissue, you know, from your love handles, it's not actually from the bone marrow, and it does not involve immunoablation where you use the chemotherapy to kind of um, uh, knock out your, your immune system down to ground zero. So there's no chemotherapy involved. Uh, prior studies for secondary progressive, you may have heard about statins, you know, the Crestor, Lipitor, Zocor family, they have a lot of anti-inflammatory properties. So that's why they've been studied not just for cholesterol, and even when people have a stroke and they don't have high cholesterol, but they still can help prevent future strokes because of their anti-inflammation property in the blood vessel, 
They've been studied for Alzheimer's dementia. They've also been studied both in animal models and some small patient studies as well. So what about the new wave in MS as we kind of finish up? Um, we talked about this, uh, these things. Let me spend a little time on the BTK inhibitors. This is really the next wave of medication for MS that you're gonna hear about uh, because there are a number of them that are right on the brink of coming out. What are BTK inhibitors? These are pills and they are novel because they affect something we haven't really seen before. They originally came out uh, for uh, oncology, kind of cancer type things, and also in the rheumatology world for different types of um, immune conditions. For, uh, for uh, rashes, uh, for you know, different kind of autoimmune skin and joint diseases. However, some of them have been modified a little bit. And now there are a number of them here in phase three, phase two, and phase one that are being studied. And the way they work is they actually affect B cell maturation. Uh, some of them have very, very good permeability and get into the brain and across the blood-brain barrier very well. But they, the nice little thing about them is uh, this is a mechanism that has not really been uh, seen in our other 22 medications, they have an effect on both the microglia and the macrophages. You think, oh, all right, well, that's interesting. We haven't really heard about that before. And at least in animal data in tadpoles, there's some data that there may be some remyelination, at least in the, the tadpole data, looking at this particular type of molecule. So uh, this is an enzyme that in, involved with a phosphorylation for all of you biochem nerds out there. So this class of medication is very, very interesting. And we've learned a lot from our oncology colleagues um, for, about this class of medications since about 2013, I believe. So in addition to BTK inhibitors, FK, fecal transplants we talked about, gold nanocrystals. So, uh, so gold nanocrystals at, in this kind of complex, gold has an interesting effect on the metabolism of cells as ATP and your energy sources, that type of thing, as far as stabilizing and decreasing what they call oxidative radicals that are, you know, shut cells down and kind of kill cells. And so that study is being done uh, just really to look at the radiographic, what are all called MR spectroscopy of the brain to kind of settle the brain from a metabolic standpoint. So it's more of a kind of a radiographic picture uh, study to see if it uh, has an effect in that sense. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus, let's talk about that. So Epstein-Barr virus, as you probably know, is very common. By age five, about 50% of five-year-olds have ex been exposed. By your teens, about 80, 85%. And then by adulthood, about 95% of people have had exposure to Epstein-Barr virus. So yes, if you go get checked and check the antibodies, you know, 95% of adults. However, if you have MS, about 99% of people with MS have been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus. So a very interesting study just came out last week, Thursday last week, really a week ago, right? And so that was published and they looked at the US military and they followed patients for 20 years from 1993 to 2013. And they screened over 10 million people uh, because they check everybody for HIV and other things. But they also looked at this data set and this is from a Sherios group at Harvard. And what they did was they found, uh, they looked at Epstein-Barr virus and they wanted to see, well, uh, it was their correlation to not having Epstein-Barr virus, getting Epstein-Barr virus, and did it increase the risk of getting MS? And it did. It actually increased risk of getting MS by about 32-fold. And interestingly, not only did they look at that, and that was published last week here in, in Science, uh, Thursday last week, just a week ago, um, they screened that many. And then also NFL, neurofilament light chain, was a, a serum marker that was also elevated in those patients compared to uh, patients who didn't develop MS. In fact, it was actually increased sometimes even almost six years before they actually even developed symptoms of MS. So when you're talking about, hey, are there any kind of blood tests for MS? We don't have any, but this is one of those hot markers that people were talking about, the NFL. So what actually happens um, with, with Epstein-Barr virus? Because you think, all right, well, if 95% of the population has it, obviously 95% of people are not getting MS. Well, if you have Epstein-Barr virus, there's this thing called molecular mimicry, where there are parts of the Epstein-Barr virus, either the, the nuclear antigen called eBNA, it has little parts on it called LMP1, which looks like um, the B cell receptor, or LMP2A, which looks like the CD4 molecule where B cells kind of get tight with the, and, and, uh, with the, with the, the T cells. It actually looks like your own parts. And so it can actually mimic certain things. And then, um, and then the eBNA1 itself sometimes actually looks like parts of your own myelin basic protein. Another part of the Epstein-Barr virus looks like an axonal protein. Another part of the Epstein-Barr virus mimics and looks like um, a, a glial adhesion molecule. 
So it basically, it's like, oh, it's like the unwanted house guest that shows up and like, yeah, they're kind of wearing your same sweatshirt that you wear and they're wearing a baseball cap that you wear. And then they come to your home, they kind of go through your closet, they start stealing your sweatshirt, they go in your freezer, they're eating your, your and dazs your Ben Jerry's, they're, they're, you know, they're stealing your Netflix password, they're logging on your computer, they get on your Fortnite, they steal your, your gamer tag, you're, you're, you're doing their orange justice, they're, they're stealing everything. And so the molecular mimicry, they're kind of mimicking all that stuff and they're actually causing your immune system to react to them and they're causing and then they leave but meanwhile your immune system is all kind of out of source and starts attacking yourself so that whole molecular mimicry they start this immune reaction and they may actually leave and be out of there but they've actually triggered this whole immune response so not only the, the b cells get all kind of bent out of shape with all these kind of things that look like parts of the b cell the t cells there's data now also from a number of years that these autoreactive T cells actually traffic, swim to the brain, set up shop in the brain, and are persistent too. So um, to that end, there are now some trials going on looking at, well, what if you actually try to treat Epstein-Barr virus if people already have Epstein-Barr? Uh, would, would that help people with MS if they already have Epstein-Barr? We don't know. All this data shows is that, yes, there really does seem to be a strong link between getting MS, but look, if you already have Epstein-Barr virus and you have MS, does it help to get rid of EBV? We, we don't know that answer. So there are two trials. One is with ATA-188. It's a T-cell uh, treatment for, it's I think a one or two, it's a one or two year study. Uh, I think, yeah. And, and then uh, to, to actually get, try to eradicate Epstein-Barr virus in an MS patient who already has Epstein-Barr. And there's also a Moderna mRNA vaccine against Epstein-Barr to one of the in the low uh, proteins. So they're looking at that. We, again, we don't know if you already have EBV, is it too late? It may just be more of a triggering thing, but again, it's not. It, it's it seems critical, uh, but that's not the only factor. Again, genetic factors, other factors as well. A uh, quick note: high dose versus low dose. There are many data sets already showing that. Look, if you have MS, the data supports using a stronger medication rather than waiting later on to switch from a low dose or low efficacy to a high dose. And that was shown in um, a UK study in 2017 by Harding. This recent August study looking at Sweden tends to be more aggressive using higher efficacy versus Denmark, which tends to use lower efficacy. That was published in August 2021 by Spellman and Jama Neurology. And then there are also studies, the Treat MS trial and Deliver MS trial here and also here in the UK. Those studies are ongoing as well. Disco MS, many of you kind of wonder, well, if I've had MS for a long time, I'm older, do I still need to take medication? If I haven't had an attack and my MRI has been stable for at least five years, and I'm over the age of 55. That's actually been studied right now. Uh, John Corboy is one of the lead people uh, looking at that. A quick note about some of the MRI things. I'd be remiss if some of my, my uh, former uh, co-residents at UCLA, Nancy Sycott and Rob Bakshi didn't uh, mention any MRI stuff. Two hot things now. One is called the central vein sign. I'm not sure if you could see from where you're sitting, uh, but the central vein sign is sometimes these spots on the MRI scan are associated with a vein that looks kind of bright like this. And also, a kind of almost looks like eyeshadow, a dark kind of, if you almost look like a, kind of a dark thing here called a PRL, a paramagnetic rim lesion. What does that mean? So it's a bunch of macrophages, again, those chopping cells that are full of iron on the outside, like an Oreo. And on the inside is kind of degeneration and axons and, and inflammation. And these are chronic plaques. Um, another way to look at is on this one, you might see a little bit better. That's a PRL. So on the outside rim, it looks like it looks like an eye, so the outside Oreo cookie dark pot, dark part, that's the, uh, the iron-filled macrophages, and on the inside is a chronic inflammation plaque. So why is that important? So the inside chronic plaque, turns out that um, in nature, in uh, September, early 8th or something, I think the first week in September, nature, uh, Peter Calabrese and Danny Reich um, over at Hopkins and NIH showed that um, not only is that uh, important from a pathologic, pathologic standpoint, in their animal model, it turns out that C1Q, part of the immune system with little proteins, that whole cascade, is actually dependent on C1Q to cause that chronic plaque. And so they actually did an animal study showing, well, if you block C1Q, the animals didn't get sick. They didn't have the plaques. They couldn't cause that chronic demyelinating plaque. And so could that be possibly a treatment for MS or the chronic inflammation associated with those chronic plaques? So again, here it is. You have an MRI finding that's interesting. You have, oh, you have the pathology that's interesting, and oh, maybe that could lead to a treatment in animals, and then um, maybe it could lead to a treatment in patients. And then 
finish up there, biomarkers, microRNAs, some interesting studies there. These are small RNAs uh, that are little snippets, usually like 22 um, uh, uh, pairs, and then they can actually have an effect on expression of genes. Uh, but there's some studies looking at that and even encapsulating it. Uh, the Brigham Group is doing that in animal studies. Ceramides we talked about and NFL we talked about. Uh, big NFL weekend, of course, uh, for all you football fans out there. So I'll finish up, but uh, you know, don't believe everything you hear. We gave you lots of information, but stick with our websites like the MSAA website. We want to make sure um, be careful what you read because there's a lot of misinformation out there. So read carefully. Uh, we sometimes uh, things look good, but they're still dangerous. So you know, here we are. Here, uh, this guy's having a good hair day, but uh, still could be dangerous, right? Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes things look good, but they're still dangerous and they're stupid. So, so think critically, right? Uh, so, you know, what we do is we combine old ideas and new ideas. Look, you, we, we encourage you to take a, a medication. We encourage you to consider a DMT. We encourage you to still do your exercise, your sleep, your diet, um, you know, see your, your physician, your nurse practitioner, uh, but also consider some of these new ideas. So some of these new ideas we talked about, uh, the diet stuff, uh, the supplements, you can consider some of these other things. Yes, you can throw some berries in there, throw some caffeine in there. If you want to take a supplement like Tudka, great. If you really want to wrestle bears, wrestle bears, that's fine too. Um, if you want to consider fecal transplants, I think, well, you know, um, you are taking responsibility of your duties. So consider that. Uh, and by attending this program, you're, you're taking care of your duty. So, you know, again, we always emphasize MS is about ability, not just ability. So whatever you can do to stay active, and happy, you are trying to achieve nirvana, your own nirvana, your own happy space, whether it's nirvana or nirvana, or if you're a basketball fan like me, um, nirvana and Krispy Kreme, Charles Barkley fan, I will stop there. And uh, if we have any time, we will uh, finish up with any questions. Well, Dr. Wu, thank you so much for this program. The chat and the Q&A was going crazy. Everybody was so excited and jazzed about the, the information that you shared. Um, we did have questions come in, but I think that you touched on a lot of them. Um, and we don't want to keep you for too much longer either. So we just, I wanted to pop in here and say thank you to you for sharing your time tonight. And thank you to everybody who joined us this evening for your very candid and kind feedback. Um, and we hope that you all are staying well and staying safe. And <laughs> I guess keep your fingers crossed for Dr. Wu's, uh, his uh, sports team. <laughs> not, not this year, yeah, not the Lakers. So uh, yeah, uh, but uh, I'll give you um, some Chinese dumplings for, for the Chinese New Year, you know. Um, Wonderful. That could help. Um, and uh, and I, I think the one thing I didn't mention from a dietary standpoint is um, chocolate, M&Ms, very important. Very, very important. One of the four Ooh. basic food groups. So that's- Thank goodness. <laughs> that, that's published in Cell, um, Journal of Immunology, Nature. I mean, all the big journals, they talk about chocolate all the time. Delicious. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Wu. And thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Um, stay well. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. Good night.